how do the available models for the development of future chemicals regulation compare in practical terms? Uh, Mr. Roger, perhaps you'd like to start on that because you've done a helpful grid. Um, yes, well, um, I think that you can think about the two big models as being maybe REACH and the US. And I think that my colleagues might agree with me that the, the REACH model, the EU model, is the more advanced. Uh, it's the more ambitious. And I think the US has been struggling for quite some time with a system which is not ambitious enough, and they have been trying to reform it for quite some time too. And that's also why some of the states in the states, have, like California, for example, have adopted a system which is actually quite like REACH. Um, so REACH is not perfect, that's for sure. Um, but I'm afraid that it's maybe the best system we have out there. OK, thank you. Ms. Shepherd. Well, REACH has been under development for many decades now and industry has largely embraced it as a robust system of chemical regulation. It's really formed the, the gold standard which other jurisdictions are looking to emulate, whether it's, whether it's Korea, whether it's Switzerland, whether it's Turkey. And I think there are a lot of, I'm sure we'll, we will discuss it, um, there's a lot of concern as to what happens if we leave the EU without having access to REACH or some form of REACH and how that's going to work out. And I would agree with Apolline that uh, TOSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act in the, in the US, cannot be compared directly with REACH. And I would say that REACH is in many respects further ahead than TOSCA even though TOSCA has been recently reformed. Okay, okay so Dr. Roger said, um, obviously, collapse in business for the only representatives mm -hmm. and um, issues around reducing market share for downstream users who will just buy from European mm -hmm. businesses rather than British businesses to avoid the, um, having to become the, the, the registrants. What, are, what do you see, if I can ask uh, you, Ms. Shepherd, and you, uh, uh, Dr. Waters, what do you think the risks to trade are? Well, in my view, unless we have some sort of transitional arrangement which will kick in when we leave the EU, um, I think there's a very real risk of a market freeze on, on product supply uh, because I see a huge uh, task ahead in terms of replicating uh, the arrangements that we already have run for us through ECHA, through the European Commission, um, and I don't think that, I think it's such an enormous task because we are so heavily reliant on the European institutions to administer and uh, regulate the whole system. And I think if there isn't a system in place from the moment we leave the EU, we could find that we don't have a system that's ready to take the, the UK registrations or administer them. We could have a, a situation, for example, where a company has applied for an authorization under EU REACH, but it hasn't been finalized at the point we leave the EU. What happens to that? Is that, is that situation in limbo? Can that company not supply? Um, if we're not ready to be up and running at the moment we leave the EU, how can UK companies who find their reach, 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 existing REACH registrations invalid, how can they supply into the EU? Um, and so I, I would welcome some form of transition arrangement, albeit at a cost, which gives us access to the European <coughs> institutions. Uh, because we, we find that, I mean, ECHA, for example, has over 600 employees. Uh, now, HSE has huge technical competence in many areas, particularly having uh, been so involved with uh, biocides issues and pesticides, but it's the sheer manpower required to replicate the tasks that ECHA fulfil. Um, and then there are the many committees within ECHA, the Risk Assessment Committee, the Committee of Socio-Economic Analysis, and so on. Um, where is all that going to be found? So to me, there, there are a number of major threats to ongoing supply uh, for industry from the point we leave the EU. 
Anything further to add? Yes. I mean, I think the thing to, to realise as well that we're not just talking about chemicals or mixtures of chemicals like paint or something like that. We're talking about products. So this carpet has dyes on it. You know, the, so the, and dyes or other components of this carpet could be restricted under reach. So you're not just talking about, you know, classic chemicals. These chairs, that chair will have some brominated flame retardants in it probably. Some of them may actually already be banned in reach because there's a gradual change. I think the thing to understand on chemicals is that we're nowhere near having addressed the problem. We have big problems from the past, you know, well-known examples like CFCs or PCBs, which are actually now at high enough levels in Wales still to prevent them breeding. But we have more recent ones like brominated flame retardants. And what we're doing is the classic <coughs> one where you go through chemicals one by one. So we've got enough evidence that's a problem. Let's take it off the market. It's accumulating in breast milk or, or whatever. Let's move to the next one. And that's what's happening in flame retardants. It's happening in till receipts, uh, where the EU has just banned, well, as a phase in of several years, uh, bisphenol A, a chemical that's used in till receipts to help them go black with heat. So that will come in. And obviously, if the UK hadn't done that ban, then the great thing you could do if you had lots of till receipt paper is you would sell it all in the UK because you wouldn't have to sell it. In. I mean, so France is already banned. It. Yeah, yeah, it could become a dumping ground. So you are talking about general products. I think that's the key thing. So it's the general products have to follow reach as well. If there's a restriction on a chemical, they must follow it. And then I think we need to. You also need to look beyond reach a bit. So there are areas where reach is referred to, um, but there's also, for example, food contact materials. So food contact material is any material that comes into contact with food deliberately. So this cup and this bottle and this lid and the, the coating on the lid, those are all food contact materials. Caroline. Yeah, I just want to put my duvet over my head. <laughs> it's, too, it's too complicated. Um, I wanted to explore a little bit about, about the UK's expertise, because we were quite involved, I think, in, in the sort of setting up of REACH and so forth. So um, how, how if, if we were indeed instrumental in, in developing the current approach within REACH, how has our role developed since then? And, and are we still leading the process of chemicals regulation, or have we now got to the point where we're being more led rather than leading? I think it's a collaborative process, but I think the UK is and has been highly respected in terms of uh, technical expertise and its contribution to date. Um, and I know that the UK plays an active part on the member state committee of uh, ECHA. Um, it's also involved in the forum for enforcement of REACH, which is done on a, with representatives of the competent authorities from member states. So I, I would say it, it continues to play an active role um, on the European stage in, in, in REACH. And certainly, as you say, it's had a, a huge... I think the UK was responsible for um, assessing a number of active substances for biocidal purposes, which, again, the biocides regime sits alongside REACH, but it's a completely separate regime. And it's, it's run... You have to have your active substance... So, so biocides are lubricants, slimicides, disinfectants, preservatives, hugely used in industry. Um, and they have a separate regime which says that the active substance, the active biocidal substance has to be approved at EU level. So there's a system within the European Commission for that. And then whoever wants to use that biocidal substance in a product, so a lubricant in industry, say, um, has to apply to the, the national authority at present for approval. And each member, the, the approval of active substances at EU level has been, has been sent out, divided out amongst the member states. And I know that the UK was the member state responsible for assessing quite a number of active substances under the biocidal products regime uh, in the early stages. And that's why I say we have the we have considerable expertise, we have considerable respect. Do we, do we have enough expertise, I suppose was my next question really, in terms of if we are trying to set up our own regulatory system outside of, of REACH, would we have the skills and the knowledge still here in the UK to do that? I would say not, and that's not um, to undervalue uh, the huge contribution to made to date, but it's simply the vastness of the task. Um, and we'd be trying to replicate uh, a small version of ECHA 
And when you look across the broad spectrum of what, actually, what ECHA actually does, it's huge. So I don't think that currently uh, the, the HSC, for example, could take on that vast body of work without a huge influx of, of people and, and funding. I think when we talk about capacity, we talk about people and resources, but we also have to think about the whole system which exists right now within REACH, and we are talking about IT tools, for example, uh, technical guidance, uh, and so that would take time and resources to develop those IT tools to explain how to use them, and so on and so on. So I think that question of capacity has really to be thought through and anticipated, and that's, that's much more complex than what it looks like, and it already looks complicated. Um, and there is also something else which maybe is more in relation to the, the question that you asked before on a trade. There is concrete capacity and there is perceived capacity. And I think the reputation of your chemical regulation does matter for trade and also for international trade. I remember when I lived in the States, I saw some products, especially toys, saying comply with EU regulation, which is quite surprising when you think about a sovereign country, isn't it? And I think REACH now has a reputation which is really good. And so we also have to think about that when we think about capacity and trade and will that have an impact on how the UK products are seen. And uh, if we are also in international trade, we also have to think about the fact that maybe UK companies will have to do three registration, you know, one for REACH, one for the UK, one for some <coughs> other country. So that has to be taken into account too. But.